I actually find Ap Apuleius in his um, defense of himself as, as a magician in a work called The Apology very helpful because he defines magic as a simple communication with your gods and, and divine beings. It's, it's acts of communication. A lot of the times that I've heard apologetic defenses of Jesus not doing magic is an argument along the lines of, well, he's not doing magic because he's not using paraphernalia like talisman. He's not using complex, complicated strings of words like you see in the Greek magical papyri, which it's it's a string of vowels or in unintelligible words that we call vocase magicae. Uh, all right, so Dr. Henry, Dr. Litwa, welcome to our show. Thanks for having us. Yes, thanks. Appreciate it. Awesome. So, um... When I invited you both on, I found it very interesting that you both had uh, subject matter specialties that coincided, uh, specifically uh, ancient Christian history. Uh, specifically, um, the topic we're talking about today is going to be uh, ancient Christian magic. Um, could Dr. Henry, could you start us off by uh, just kind of telling us a little bit about ancient Christian magic, what it entails, how is it related to the um, earlier forms of demotic magic that uh, we found we find in the uh, the scrolls. Magic is one of those words that is so difficult to, de to define. Um, I often say it's, 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 it's not a separate thing from religion. Like when we, when you have a ritual that calls upon a higher power, to accomplish something that you desire, like what is the real difference between a prayer and writing something down on an amulet or a curse tablet? Like if you say, dear God, please protect me, that, that's a prayer. And if you put it on an object and you wear that around your neck, suddenly it's called a talisman or an amulet. So a lot of the, the bifurcation between religion and magic is a, is a subjective distinction. Uh, the same goes with miracle versus magic. You know, Jesus himself was accused of doing magic by some of his opponents, like Celsus, uh, as as described by the early Christian author Origen. So, when when I define magic, when I use the term magic, I'm usually referring to small scale rituals that people do on an individual level. Uh, I I try to avoid the term actually and use more specific terms like rituals that are meant to protect or curse or heal. Because so many of these things that we call magic fall into one of those categories. So a healing am, a healing spell or formula, you know, please take away this headache from, from me. Uh, protection, keep this demon away from me. Um, and lumped into that is exorcism. And then cursing. We have all these objects that are lead curse tablets, lead curse tablets called defixiones, where you would write down like curse so-and-so for stealing my, my cloak. May the, the power of the gods subject judgment upon him. So we have rituals about cursing, protecting, healing, exercising. And if we want to call that magic, let's use the term very loosely, because uh, it's not necessarily, when we were, when we use the word magic, it suddenly brings up ideas of secrecy or subversive or evil. But as far as we can tell from the archaeology of magic, this stuff was not, it wasn't being done in secret. You, you were likely able to go to your local shop and be like, hey, I really need an amulet for my sick baby. What can you do for me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it really, uh, our distinction between things like magic and religion, um, as Marvin Meyer points out in his text, the um, text of ancient Christian magic, he, he says that we really tend to, nowadays, scholars create this false dichotomy between religion and uh, magic is something we do versus what they do. Um, I, f I find it very uh, interesting that uh, there's a lot of continuity between what's going on. I mean, even though the um, theology may change, uh, for lack of a better term, they're still doing the same technological um, practices. Um, so I found that very interesting. Uh, Dr. Litwa, did you um, wanna take this up? Yeah, well, I, I mean, that's a, a super introduction um, that's already been given. Um, I, you have to start out with theoretical observations here. And yeah, the fact is there's been an ap apologetical stream that has continually tried to distinguish either religion and magic or miracle and magic. Um, you know, and a good example of this is, you know, the phylacteries 
um, that you know Jews are, are called upon to to wear, and yeah. So if if you're Jewish, it, it's a phylactery. Um, if you're Greek and Roman, it's a talisman, and you know you can have negative nuances that are wrapped up in this unnecessarily for the the Greeks and Romans who are, you know, still you know called by that Christian name of depreciation, the the pagans. Um, so we need to be very careful about that. You know, there's many imprecatory prayers in the in the Psalms, um, and these are essentially curses. Um, but we use that kind of fancy, you know, name, imp imprecatory prayer, so that you know we can kind of clean up <laughs> the um, the violence of of the rhetorical language. I actually find Ap Apuleius, um, in his um, defense of himself as as a magician, um, in a work called the Apology, very helpful because he defines magic as uh, as simple communication with uh, your gods and, and divine beings. Um, it's it's acts of communication. And um, it is, yeah, th oftentimes the there's a certain domesticity to the to the rites. So the the rites will be performed home in, in the home there of a of a smaller scale. Um, then they can be performed anywhere. So if you wanted to distinguish you know, state cults, uh, the big state cults from uh, magical practices, you might be able to do that be on the idea that, you know, the, the state cults, you know, when they want to sacrifice, everybody's involved. It's a, it's a public holiday. It's a huge festival with a feast and they bring in this huge bull and it's sacrificed by a large altar. Everyone can see it. It's public. Um, and yeah, the, the the smaller scale rites, um, as Dr. Henry said, they're not um, they're not secretive, but they are um, more private in many cases. So you'll you'll do it um, at night uh, at a junction of three roads, or you'll do it in your living room. Um, I mean, I'm tempted to uh, almost queer the discourse here because. Uh, you you could just define all miracle as magic, and and we could just define you know every everything as magic, you know, <laughs> including Jesus's miracles, um, and just see where that, that takes us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ironically, so my dissertation advisor in my doctoral program, David Frankfurter, writes about this in his book Christianizing Egypt. And he uses the term magic not as a high fidelity def definition, trying to identify certain rituals, but as a very loose heuristic. He almost uses it almost as just as an adjective, like this thing is magical, this thing is magical, insofar as it is efficacious, it has agency. So he'll use terms like there's there's a magic to the spoken word, and that magic of the spoken word could be in a quote-unquote sanctioned religious situation um like i i baptize you in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit boom suddenly you are baptized like that there's a magic to that word like that 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 phrase was said by a literate specialist and something happened uh, he says there's a magic to the written word so if you if you write down something and especially in a in a, a mostly illiterate society uh, the the power and the efficacy and the agency that writing has. So he he happily applies the term magic to almost anything uh, as a qualifier, not as a type of ritual, but as a quality of a ritual. If the ritual means to to bring some agency or power into the here and now, we let's call that magical. And that could be something as simple as as a, a wedding. You know, I pronounce you a married couple. You know, boom, your ontological status has changed. So in that in that case, it, yeah, it's playing with the term magic. Well said. Well said. Yeah, performativity. Performativity is is part of it, where, where you you say something and then by the very act of saying it, you do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I was reading uh, Brian Copenhaver's book, um, the Book of Magic. Um, I think it's a re-release of an earlier text he did but um he makes this really interesting point about simon getting back to one of your uh 
uh, specialties, Dr. Lee, uh, Simon of Samaria, like we think of Acts chapter 8, verse 4 through 25 as uh, nowadays, because we're looking at it from a certain point of view, uh, with certain kinds of glasses on uh, back back on the text, that Simon's doing something bad because he's asking Peter for, um, you know, give me this power. But Copenhaver makes a really interesting point. Um, he says that it's a natural mistake um, them doing this in Acts because in, in in Simon's day, magic was a commercial enterprise. You have uh, religious specialists, you know, making receipt uh, recipes, charms, curses, tablets, uh, curse tablets, amulets, talismans, love potions, just like y'all are talking about. So um, that was very interesting. And uh, Dr. Litwa brought up, uh, you know, New Testament um, Jesus cursing. Uh, I'm I'm really reminded of Jesus in Mark chapter. What chapters is that? Chapter eleven. Mark 11, verse 12, where he's cursing the fig tree. And then I'm thinking about um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, where he's talking about, uh, he, he's basically in, like doing a Greek magical papyri curse. He's, he's like saying, hand this guy over in the flesh to Satan. He's saying, uh, Elethron tes sarcos, you know, in the flesh. Um, and he's he's like present in the spirit of the Lord, you know, Um you know, tu emo penumatos sun uh, te duname tu curio. You know, he's he's present in the power of the Lord when they're going to hand this guy over to Satan to be destroyed. I found that very interesting. Like, we're looking at it with this artificial divide, whereas, like, somebody at that time, there's no huge distinction there. Um, I just wondered if y'all had any further thoughts on that. Yeah, interesting point. So in in John 3, we hear that, you know, the spirit blows where it wills. But if you look carefully at, at Acts chapter 8, and this is distinctive to Acts chapter 8, um, there's a, the, the people are baptized, including Simon, who, you know, becomes a Christian, just like everybody else. And um, they, there's a delay in, in the giving of the Spirit so that the apostles have to drop down to uh, Samaria. And then the Spirit only comes upon people exactly when the apostles lay their hands on people. And so it's very different than, than what you find in John. The, it's, it's not the Spirit just comes upon anybody. It, the Spirit comes whenever the apostles apply their hands. And it's that performative aspect that, um, I won't say mechanical, but predictable aspect, the predictability of the spirit transmitted through hands. That's what Simon observes, and that's what he wants to get. And of course, Peter goes ballistic, and, you know, but Simon, in, instead of, you know, trying, you know, chomping away, uh, wanting to, you know, claim battle against the apostles, like Irenaeus says, he, he cries and he says, pray for me so that, you know, I, I can uh, come to a better understanding. But that's really how the, how the text actually portrays the giving of the spirit. It, it's a magical operation, I would say, because of that performative aspect. Excellent. What about you, Dr. Henry? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the times that I've heard apologetic defenses of Jesus not doing magic is an argument along the lines of, well, he's not doing magic because he's not using paraphernalia like talisman. He's not using complex, complicated strings of words like you see in the Greek magical papyri, which it's it's a string of vowels or in, unintelligible words that we call vocase magicae. And, you know, Jesus just uses short usually short sentences like, you know, peace be still, or just laying on of hands, uh, setting aside the, the two miracles where he uses spit, it's almost always just speech and gesture. But the, the effects are similar, you know, it's, it is causing things to happen in the here and now supernaturally. So the difference is not so much uh, quality, it's just a difference in complexity. And there's still a there's still a performative aspect of putting a hand on somebody or saying something authoritatively, and so much of what we would call magical practice probably entailed that short short formulas, laying on of hands. But that's the sort of stuff that doesn't survive in the archaeological record. You know what survives in the archaeological record are you know papyrus uh, formulas from Egypt, uh, sometimes bronze amulets from Asia Minor or Syria, uh, but like 
so much of what we call magic is lost to us that was probably happening every single day. Amazing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just reminded of Mark, you know, Jesus is telling everybody constantly, Igairo, you know, Igairo rise, you know, right? So uh, he's like commanding them like with some kind of power. Um, well, gentlemen, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. Dr. Henry, where can people find you? I guess the main place you can find me online is my YouTube channel, Religion for Breakfast. So youtube.com slash religion for breakfast. It's a one-stop shop world religions YouTube channel. A lot of this stuff is early Christianity just because that's my field, but I'll cover everything from Buddhism to Islam to Haitian Vodou. You know, you, you name it, it's, it's going to be published on Religion for Breakfast. Dr. Henry has an amazing Patreon as well, so be sure to join that. Um, Dr. Litwa, where can people find you? Yeah, just uh, punch my name into YouTube. I've got a, a small channel as well as a Patreon. And yeah, um, obviously uh, I'm able to answer most questions over the Patreon. So hop on there and um, uh, make yourself known. Would love to meet you and uh, hear what you're thinking about. Right, and if you want to learn Coptic to read these spells yourself, Dr. Lotla and I are doing that right now. So, uh, you know, hop on. He teaches those languages too. So, it really comes in handy. So, um, until next time, thank you, gentlemen, very much. Um, have a pleasant night.